So is philosophy useful in medical practice? And this is a dialogue between a um, medical doctor and a philosopher. Uh, Richard Levy is a medical doctor since 1983 and uh, he graduated from Karolinska Institute. Uh, he is a specialist in neurology and rehabilitation and at the moment professor of neuro rehabilitation at the Lin Shopping University Hospital. Welcome. Thank Karolinska. you. Thank you, Luis. And, and you are Luis de Miranda. Uh, you are a philosopher. You have a PhD from University of Edinburgh. You are currently at the Center for Medical Humanities at Uppsala University. And in addition to that and many other things, you are a philo philosophical counselor working at the Philosophical Parlor in Stockholm since 2018. So this is a, a question that um, is uh, formulated in a way that we might not seem uh, biased, although we have to perhaps confess for the sake of honesty that we do believe that the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, I am the most perhaps um, suspicious of bias since I am a philosopher myself. So I will let you speak first uh, as a medical doctor. Um, it is not very common to, to hear a medical doctor, uh, you know, say that philosophy is useful uh, in his uh, practice. So could you explain uh, to us how you came to that conclusion? Well, first of all, I, I'm a little bit biased myself because I had, have had an interest in philosophy yeah, as a sort of hobby or, yeah, as a hobby, as an amateur yeah, uh, since uh, my youth. So um, that's uh, maybe biasing a little bit. But secondly, I think it's a matter of uh, maturity, you can say, that I've been working in medicine now for almost 40 years. And in the beginning, you are very much uh, uh, created, recreated by the, the medical education, which is of course, and should be perhaps very biased towards uh, science, natural science. It's not a humanistic education, it's a scientific education with a lot of basic science in the beginning with biology and chemistry and biochemistry and anatomy and physiology and pathology and so on. So you tend to, it tends to affect you. Then you start meeting patients after a while, real people. First you meet dead people, then you meet living people. And uh, in the beginning you are so scared, I would say to make mistakes that would be fatal for, or for the patient and thus also for yourself. So you stick very much to the, to the protocol, so to speak. But very soon, most of us realize that reality is different. People are not only um, parts of populations, they are also individuals. And individuals manifest their disease or illness in many different ways. And uh, sooner or later you find out that if you try to objectify your patient and try to understand them only through radiology and chemistry, you will never understand them properly. They will not like you and you will not get rapport, rapport with them. So it grows on you more on some people than on others. But the, the, the lingering feeling that increases is that something is missing in your mode of communication. Something is getting lost in translation between reality and medical lingo. So that's, that's where I come from. Mm. That seems to relate very much to um, a fragmentation that is present in all aspects of our societies, uh, what I sometimes call the uh, arithmomania, the, the tendency to transform into numbers and statistics, all the aspects of the, uh, the human experience. And, and of course, 
this misses the fact that the person in front of you uh, is as a, as a mind and, and emotions, and those are part of our experience uh not only of life but also of her condition yeah. and so how did you um practically because for example uh in in my practice uh as philosophical counselor i find that there is a sort of a ground foundation which is very simply uh what we could call deep listening and, and, and dialogue and what was called by Plato dialectics. And this enough is, is enough to create uh, a, a basis for then other forms of, of, of course of analysis, uh, dialogue and, and opening to, to certain possibilities. But just this fact of um, deep listening and dialogue, do you, do you how do you yourself experience that open yourself to that and is it is it easy to practice it in today's medicine yeah uh, it's uh, it's unfortunately it's quite difficult to to because uh, um, first of all there is a pressure in time the time limitation uh, this is especially true for the colleagues that are working in primary care where you might have only 10 or 15 minutes or less for every, every given encounter. If you know the patient well since before, that makes it easier because you can add to the puzzle, to the jigsaw puzzle, you add pieces as you meet again and again and again. Also, you might need other meet other members of the family or friends and so on. You can create this puzzle. But uh, continuity is also a problem. So it might be that you meet the person only once and only for 10, 15 minutes with a very uh, nominally with a very specific problem, you know, like headache or pain in the back or whatever. And then you need to exclude the red flags. And the red flags are usually very scary conditions. So you put emphasis on excluding that and it becomes more like an interrogation rather than deep listening, unfortunately. But, and the problem is that even if you get more time, which you have in the hospital, sometimes if you have a, a, a consultation, you might have even up to, let's say half an hour to an hour for the meeting. You tend to get influenced by your time pressure. So maybe you don't even use that to listen. I think that one important lesson, very difficult for me and for most other colleagues, is also to be quiet, to be to shut up and to listen, as you say. So that's already part of the what we are discussing now, why I think philosophy is important. Philosophy right. is, is not a, having monologues, it's more like a dialogical thing. Mm. And that includes listening. This aspect of uh, the uh, interrogation uh, as opposed to dialogue, isn't it this sort of a structural uh, phenomenon in the sense that when we look at the definition of uh, diseases um, in, um, in uh, official textbooks uh, and practices, we often see that diseases are de defined by criteria. For example, uh, depression, you, you have 10 criteria uh, some of which are considered a primary, other secondary, and, and there's sort of a greed, and you sort of tick the boxes. And, and so that created, by the way, a process where um, often the medical care is associated with uh, a teleology that is to give a pill, to, to give a medication, which I find is not necessarily uh the only function uh, of course um of a doctor so how do we uh, is how do we keep time for what you are saying for for listening when uh there is this um definition of the conditions that is itself uh very analytic right and 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 as a sort of a, a process of um uh, this discrimination like a decision tree 
of which the outcome seems to have to be in a way or another a, a form of um, often uh, some form of intake or, or, or chemical protocol. Well, well, of course, it, 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 you have to you have to adjust your your uh, method to the to the sit, actual situation. I mean, in an emergency department, uh, I think philosophy is less uh, applicable uh, in the individual case, at least. <clears throat> Whereas in, in every practice, you have patients that are more difficult to get a grip on. So uh, some cases are pretty uh, straightforward. If you break a leg, you don't need the philosophical counseling. You, uh, primarily, you need a plaster cast or a surgery. And this is uh, true for many conditions. But there is also a very large group of persons, patients, uh, fellow human beings that have less well-defined problems. This is typical for a large part of the psychiatric spectrum, where, as you say, uh, the diagnoses are not based on chemistry and not based on radiology because we don't we don't find anything there. So it's criteria based, and that creates a very it sometimes very often you feel that you're trying to push a square peg in a round hole, so to speak. It doesn't fit very well. It's, it's also the problem when you ask very general questions in, in terms of quality of life, like how, how, uh, how much do you like your life from zero to 10? Mm. I mean, it's a bit naive to expect that somebody, if you, if you reflect about it, how easy is it to answer a question like that? It's so multi-layered. Mm. So the point is that I think that you should remain open, especially in the so-called complex cases that you might be missing the target. And in order to find the target, the, the, the crux of the matter, uh, I got the impression, you know, I got the association to, I read about Dilte, I don't know if I, I pronounce it right. And he made the dis distinction between the nomothetic and the ideographic, you know, that some, type of science is nomothetic where you are generalizing to, to laws that apply to everything. And then you have the ideographic, which is more unique and historically based. And so maybe you could say something about that, because I think that this is exactly the distinction that you need to, to make with the patient. Is this a person who has a very well-defined generalized, generalizable problem that you know you can go to the cookbook and you can solve it, or is this a more uh, unique situation in a way? Right. And so in philosophy, that corresponds to the moment of where we let ourselves be surprised, right? Since Aristotle's stuff in the beginning of philosophy, this idea of uh, curiosity. And indeed, if we are in the process of interrogation and trying to feed people within a filter, uh, we are not letting ourselves... Um, the opportunity to be uh, surprised, astonished, and perhaps even to discover something new, which is not only a philosophical, but also a scientific criteria. I want to ponder a bit with you the idea of emergency that you uh, mentioned. This is very interesting because there are emergencies in, in, in uh, of course, in hospitals, right? Uh, accidents and, and but there are emergencies in life, right? When we suddenly have to take an important decision uh, that not that does not necessarily come announced, uh, and and this happens quite often. And I realize when I have a dialogue about people, and I do have dialogues about people who are uh, usually uh, not in, let's say, not in in physical pain. In, in, but they might be in, in, in existential uh, pain in some cases. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I find interesting is that we tend to wait for emergencies to think. Uh, and when we have those emer existential emergencies, we do not have time. So in this sense, philosophical health, as I see it, is also a preparation 
an anticipation, uh, a sort of a training, a form of martial art, even sometimes I say, so that uh, when the big decisions come, we can take them uh, in harmony with a worldview that has been thought of. Yeah. And, and in a way, uh, we can say, well, I'm, I'm sure that there are some emergency uh, moments, even in, in the hospital environment, that are actually philosophical, that depend on a certain worldview. Uh, I don't know, uh, you, you're probably better at examples with me, but if donation of an organ or, or uh, you know, uh, acceptance of a certain uh, sur surgery that might have chances of like 50-50 or 30-60 chances of success or other, um, other decisions that can be dramatic and that if we are not, um, if we've not anticipated them by doing a work and what do I really believe, what, what is my what is my view of the world and therefore how should I live? Uh, these decisions then might be taken by default in accordance to a certain, uh, you know, set of belief that is the standard normal one in, in the society in which I live. And for example, I suppose that we could also use the example of, um, you know, uh, assisted uh, uh, death, uh, should I, uh, how long should a person suffer uh, and with or without uh, consciousness, et cetera. So what, what's your, um, have you in your uh, practice uh, had those moments uh, where the decision must be taken very, very quick, but in fact you realize, or even the patient realizes that she is not prepared to take that decision. Yeah, that's quite often actually the case, not in, in the particular specialty I'm working right now, even though it occurs there too. But as I say that you can define emergency in, in many different ways, but I think typically that it, uh, I agree with you that in many cases, it would have been much better if there was a preparatory <clears throat> measures taken that, that that is exactly one of the important potentials for philosophy and medicine because when if we if we use the if we define emergency in the typical way of medicine then it's very difficult to cram in there some sort of deep listening or or reflection or anything you you just need to do something uh, but uh, there are there are aspects of emergencies that have uh, I think have a natural philosophical uh, side to it. And first of all, it's as you said, the preventative or the preparation. Because uh, I used to I, I usually say to healthcare professionals when I lecture that the difference between the patients and us are that the patients are right now. Uh, manifestly sick and that's why they are here in the hospital and we are right now not manifestly sick at least but we might very well have been manifestly sick or we might very well 100% likely to become manifestly sick sooner or later so the question is what can we learn from the patients even though they are sick right now or just because they are sick right now and we are not so that's one aspect. The other aspect is the aftermath of an emergency. Uh, as you, we have discussed in other contexts, uh, I, I meet a lot of patients who get ill or get damaged, get uh, trauma uh, very uh, from nowhere, like a flash from the sky. And then they have a condition like a stroke or like a spinal cord injury or a traumatic brain injury that will have repercussions for the rest of their lives. So in that case, it's more ab about how to deal with the aftermath of the emergency. The emergency per se has its protocol. 
but the preparation and the aftermath are very much uh, amendable to uh, philosophy. Right. So we are seeing we we saying we we are distinct uh, making a distinction here between two aspects uh, of um, philosophizing. One which would be the philosophizing of the patient and another one which would be the philosophizing yeah. of the of the doctor right and and of course if this is done in dialogue this creates some, some sort of a, a space uh, where if i understand you correctly not only the the patient would have time um to reflect and in, in indeed i suppose that after a serious uh, spinal cord injury, uh, the entire, um, you know, uh, structure of your, your, your life world, it needs to be uh, reassessed and redefined and, and projects are, have now a new color and a new dimension. Um, but at the same time, the, um, the doctor, I suppose, I, I suppose that sometimes some medical doctors feel like they are a cog in a machine perhaps uh, and that they don't have themselves the time to um, work medicine as perhaps more an anticipation of, of, of the future. Is that what you're saying when you're talking about um, the, uh, the, uh, the manifestation of, yeah. of the disease, right? Something that uh, it, it almost seems like you're you're entering in into a field uh, which is the phenomenology of medicine, which in which there, there's been uh, interesting contributions since uh, the fifties. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of Ludwig Binswanger, who um, who saw care as a process of repossibilization. And, and, and so we, we do allow um, the, the mind body, because in, in, in his view, this is uh, uh, one, the said the two aspects of one phenomenon, we allow the mind body to, to assess in a form of, you know, a, your dynamic tension is like, I see possibilities uh, in the future for me, even though my my relation to to space and to the others is impaired and not the same as it as it was before um, an accident. Yes, but uh, since you you started from the example of or we started from the example of emergencies, I'm saying that there is a a, a timing factor here. It's like most things in life that timing is very important. I mean, it, you, you couldn't expect a person who uh, broke their neck yesterday to be able to reflect on that because of psychological reasons. I mean, it's, it's not uh, doable and it's not even advisable, I think. <clears throat> but there is, on the other hand, there is a, a, talking about the mental space that regardless of uh, the fact that you didn't choose to, to enter this emergency, the emergency per se as such might open up. I, I, I sometimes say that life makes philosophers out of everyone uh, some, sometimes. So this is a type of situation. That's, that's one of the selling arguments for philosophy in medicine is that not that everyone is a philosopher, all the time, which is ridiculous to, to, to claim. But the fact that all of us will be philosophers in certain circumstances, as you said previously, that when things happen, shit, when shit happens, you tend to start to reflect because you, you must reflect because there is chaos and people cannot accept chaos for a long time. So- right. So what I'm saying is that the emergency, there is a timing factor. There is one uh, limitation when you can start reflecting on it and you cannot do that immediately. Then there is a, 
a, a distant factor where you stop reflecting. But between those two uh, extremes, between those po poles, there might be a space uh, or a time space, so to speak, time and space for philosophy. Right. It's opened up and it will close again. Mm. And, and we are bad at, at using that space for something else than the, uh, let's say, nomothetical medical way of doing things. And it's interesting that you um, refer to the idea of chaos as something that is often perceived as negative, right? And we know that there is another take on chaos uh, with the pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece, but also uh, to a certain extent, I would, I would regard with Taoism. And in my own uh, methodology, which I, I called creolectic, I, I often refer to chaos as uh, with another word. I call it the creole precisely because it's less, less negative, right? The creole as in creative real. And sometimes, uh, a certain acceptance of the chaos might be a first step uh, towards uh, seeing the possibilities and, and, and the creative possibilities uh, in that chaos, which leads me to a connection to the title we have given to our first um, conversation. Is philosophy useful in medical practice? And it's interesting because there is a sort of a um, linguistic trap there, because we are already assuming, perhaps, that things need to be useful, right? And and isn't that uh, what many things are in our society are about? This this idea that it needs to be efficient, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be uh, useful. But perhaps uh, sometimes we have to reconciliate with the fact that some activities might not be useful uh, in the sense that we normatively evaluate what is useful or not. So in our question, I think there needs to be also a moment where we are questioning the very uh, norms of society uh, in terms of what is useful. For example, uh, very often we consider that the person needs to be able to to work right and and i've worked um quite a bit with computer scientists and on the topic of artificial intelligence and very often there is this uh, general reaction of, of the public which is oh artificial intelligence will will uh destroy a lot of jobs and therefore we react as if it were chaos and but another reaction could be okay so how, why not are we defined by our, by our jobs can we imagine a society in which um, our presence in the world could be triumphant without necessarily implying a successful career uh, in which we wake up at five o'clock and are still at the office at nine yeah, but I mean, the, talking about, I agree with you to some extent in terms of this usefulness or utilitarian, it's a, it's a bit uh, restricting. But on the other hand, if we, are, if we are realistic about medicine and even in our country, rich country, if you cannot uh, discuss uh, interventions in terms of some kind of usefulness, they will be uh, they will not be applied mm. it, it's a bit the difference between need to have and nice to have so if you want uh, something nice you can listen to music or go to the theater you can you can of course argue that it's useful to go to the theater and to listen to music i would claim so but it's very indirectly useful so in terms of usefulness in medicine of philo philosophy being useful in medicine or not. I think that one tech strategy would be to, to show that, that even by using these very uh, restricting standards, it is useful. People manage better. They, they feel better. They have a higher quality of life, more satisfied, blah, blah, blah. 
better return to work, whatever. If you can prove that, which remains to be done, but if we can prove that or someone can prove that, that will be the proof of concept. Then you can go from there and say that, well, the real beauty of this is much bigger. It's uh, uh, so on. Right. But uh, I think otherwise we will be, uh, the philosopher will be in a very poor situation when you're starting to talk, you know, economics and uh, politics. Hmm. Which unfortunately. You, yes, I, and, and I see that uh, this seems somehow to, uh, to call for a, a, a little bit of dialogue on the aspect of um, mental health, uh, in which I think um, uh, philosophy can be very immediately uh, shown to have a very good uh, effects. Uh, we know that um, even in a country like Sweden, um, the um, medication approaches to mental health uh, and, and stress, for example, we're talking here, I'm talking here about, uh, I'm not talking here about extreme cases, I'm talking here about, you know, uh, the, uh, but even some diagnosis that people uh, um, use in relation to their identity, right? We, so we have a lot of, I myself as a philosophical counselor, uh, meet people who have been diagnosed sometimes very early in life um, uh, with, you know, bipolar one or two diagnoses or, or ADHD, etc. And they seem to relate that to who they are, to the, the very philosophical question of identity. And that seems to impair, have impaired their uh, perception of what they can do. And what I've seen in empirical protocol um, several times is that um, in very few sessions of philosophical counseling, they, they change their attitude towards uh, the diagnose uh, and, and they don't see it anymore as something that is a definition of themselves. They even uh, in, in, in certain cases um, change their relationship to the medication, which seemed almost like an inevitable habit before and which they sort of uh, uh, liberate themselves uh, from. So, uh, but that's very, of course, that's the, that's the paradox of philosophy, right? Is that it, it wants to be applied and it wants to be useful um, in the sense that people probably uh need it's not only that they need meaning is that they they are their bodies and their minds are already consciously or not um worked and and uh, elaborated by meanings ideologies uh normativity so they are there so for, the philosopher is not saying you don't have meaning you need meaning the philosophers say you are more or less consciously and, and very times uh, not that consciously uh, following patterns of thought and belief that uh, might not be the best for you, but they might not be the ones that actually correspond to who you really are, who you really want to be and, and, and what is your um, real, your, your deep orientation. So that's, that's of course, uh, the uh, the kind of uh, paradox is that it's it's those things are not measurable. So my question here is: Fine, uh, you, philosophy also wants to help people. I do as a philosopher, as a philosophical practitioner, but I'm I'm also a little bit um, cautious and and you know. Uh, questioning the possibility of uh, of an evaluation and, and a measurement uh, given the fact that I think that philosophy is a sort of a bridge between these two extremes the care for the whole the care for, for totality right in a world where most disciplines they need to to deal with the part and, and fix their 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 part and 
at the very opposite, the care for singularity. And here I mean singularity in, in the sense of subjectivity, the fact that each of us uh, is, is unique and has a, uh, the possibility of access to a unique destiny. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I understand. And I think that, of course, we, first of all, it will be like mixing oil and vinegar to some degree. It, it have to be, because that's why we are, <laughs> why we need to have this type of dialogues. Mm. So it, it, it's better than mixing be. oil and water. At least oil oil and vinegar, you can have a nice uh, sauce. Vinaigrette, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if you, yeah, but it will still, uh, yeah. Anyway, okay, oil and water is even better uh, metaphor. But what I'm, what I'm thinking about is that, so it's not the point to get consensus exactly, but I, I think it's important to retain this aspect of usefulness, uh, but it has to be qualified what we mean by it. When you talk about diagnosis, I, I have a thought on that too, that I agree with you that it, it, in case that was the, the correct way of interpreting you, that people tend to become their diagnosis or they, to look upon themselves as the diagnosis. And I, I have a remedy for that, or at least a way of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, making it more difficult by, by showing the absurdity. If you go to the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, I think is the latest, uh, you will find that anybody, including you and me, have at least three, to four, five different diagnoses. We fulfill the criteria. Actually, it's impossible, I would claim, not to be diagnosed as having some sort of mental disorder because there are hundreds of them. And the criteria are created in such a way that they are quite inclusive, not all of them, of course. So, uh, and there is the further, so, so, so this is again, I mean, uh, shows the absurdity. If you go to the extreme, it's absurd. Secondly, uh, humanity doesn't change very quickly. I mean, the human, human species is, you can still read Socrates and, you know, or read Plato rather than Socrates. You can read about Socrates. And you can feel quite at home, or at least you get the impression that this is not people totally different from ourselves or Aristotle or whoever. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm aiming at is that uh, nevertheless, a lot of diagnoses come and go. Some diagnoses are, uh, are, uh, are actually invented, you know. Some you discover, like tuberculosis, you need to know that there is a uh, organism that creates it, that creates the disease. That's a discovery, but you can also invent diagnosis. Right. You, 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 and, and, and those can be de-invented. You can stop having that. The, that diagnosis is, I mean, like um, during the late 1900th century, there were quite some people that had this neurasthenia. You cannot make the diagnosis of neurasthenia today but you have other alternatives. Right. So uh, you shouldn't get, we shouldn't get lost in these uh, labels. Mm. Right, and <laughs> this is also cultural. For example, neurasthenia uh, has been popular in China and in still is to a certain extent uh, much, much more. So it has to do also with how a, a, a given culture responds. But we do, I, I think I, uh, I understand what you're referring to. Uh, we've seen in, in the 20th history of uh, pathology uh, new uh, conditions that were labeled and, and, uh, and that once the doctors agree that this actually should not be used anymore, we see also the curve of people affected by that condition. The curve uh, goes down. So there are phenomenon of entrainment. Uh, but Okay, so I was trying to play a little bit the devil's advocate because I do uh, agree that uh, philosophy could be extremely uh, um, as not as a replacement, but uh, as a uh, you know a, a method that comes in in complement of certain practices, very useful in medical practice, and and I think we could perhaps conclude 
uh, today's conversation, because I think we will have more conversations, uh, we can conclude today's conversation by saying that uh, they are, uh, when we are curing and caring, we're dealing with a person. And that person's um, destiny and, and, and presence in the world and, and needs also to be assessed uh, if we don't want to have a sort of dualistic uh, division between a, a body that would be a machine and that we, we, um, we take care of as a car, basically, and, and, and the mind that would be disassociated uh, and and that would be, by the way, itself treated as a machine uh, that would need to be uh, adapted uh, to the norms and uh, functional uh, um, functionalism of a given society. So, under this abstract abstract words, what I mean here is that I would like you perhaps to conclude with a, a few examples of uh, practice in which. Um, a, a, a dialogue that would be open to, to concepts, uh, to, um, you know, uh, ideals, uh, meaning, uh, where, why, where am I going with my life? Uh, what do I believe in? What are my values? This can be useful and and practiced so who could who could give that touch is it is it the nurse is it the the medical doctor would it be a, a new form of training for philosophers and we know that people who study philosophy are, are, are very often not um in a, in a very good position in the labor market so is it who do you think or is it a collaboration between these um, uh, actors? Yeah, I, I, very good. No, I think it's, a, I would say it, it should be ideally a collaboration. And that requires that, that the philosopher learn a little bit more about medicine. And the, and the medical and paramedical and nursing, all of them need to know more philosophy. So you need to be able to speak with each other and you need to, to understand the vocabulary and so on. But I think it's quite simple in a way that, that you know, uh, philosophy, what is it? I mean, it's both a, a topic and it's a method, uh, several methods. So for instance, what is psychotherapy? I mean, psychotherapy is rehashing, if I, I, I'm not a psychologist, but so they will hate me, but some of them, but I mean, <laughs> what is, what is uh, psychotherapy? I mean, what is, uh, you look at the Stoics, the Stoic way of the, Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus. This is uh, psychotherapy. I mean, uh, it's a way of preparing yourself for life and uh, the hardships of life. So there you have it. Long before, uh, long before it was called uh, anything else, you have the existentialists talking about, uh, you know, the the predicament of life. You have the, you, so it's already there, first of all. It, it's called something, it's called the cognitive behavioral therapy, it's called uh, uh, ACT, it's called uh, whatever it's called. Then you have critical thinking, which is a part of, and logic, which is also a part of, of philosophy, definitely. And it's also a part of every type of science. If you don't have it, all type of, of intellectual activity requires some degree of, of logic and some, some degree of critical thinking, which is sorely needed everywhere. And of course, it's also important in medicine. So, and also con conceptualizing things, also very important. What is the concept? How is it defined? So just by going through the, the history of philosophy, you find a gold mine that is already there. So I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel, but the problem is that in Sweden, especially in many other countries, we have forgotten that gold mine. It's not taught. So we are taught to be specialists, but we are not ta taught about uh, the, the, the great history of philosophy, intellectual history, 
that we could use now. Right. That's, that's my hope. Yes, and, and so and this is more than a hope for for the two of us. It, it is a it is a now a, a work that we're doing, and for example, through these conversations, uh, which I I hope uh, we can uh, make them uh, monthly. We're trying to go deeper and deep, deeper. This was a sort of a, a an introduction, right, to to our yeah. uh, concern, and uh, it was, I think useful uh to thank you I, I, likewise and uh and we'll talk soon okay all the best